is from getting the message, being the messenger, and then working hard at trying to save people who are chronically ill. You're only as healthy as you're absorbing, digesting, and excreting. And that peanut butter bowl cereal, guess what? That's labeled a whole grain. <laughs> what the true. F? From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Marissa Lennox. Welcome to The Zoomer, I'm Marissa Lennox. Are you one of those people that's been jumping from doctor to doctor and feel like you have no answers? Well, Anthony William, medical medium and number one New York Times bestselling author is not a doctor. He's not even trained in the medical profession. But millions subscribe to his teachings and we intend to find out why. But before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. It's the Rodney Dangerfield of human organs. It gets no respect, but the gut is actually one of the most diverse and fascinating parts of the body. From top to tail, it has an internal surface area of between 30 and 40 square meters, enough to cover half a badminton court. Over the course of a lifetime, approximately 50,000 tons of food will make its way through it. That is some tight pipe. Meanwhile, the gut, with its 100 trillions of bacteria, is the best school for training the immune system. Two-thirds of our immune cells are trained in it. And then there are the hormones. About 20 different kinds are produced by the gut. But what makes the gut so special? Its ability to talk to our brain. Revolutionizing medicine's understanding of the links between digestion, mood, health, and even the way you think. All right, I'd like to welcome the originator of the global celery juice movement and number one New York Times bestselling author of several books, including Medical Medium, Cleanse to Heal, and his newest, Brain Saver and Brain Saver Protocols, the medical medium, Anthony William. Welcome to the program. It's an honor. It's an honor to be here. Seriously, I can't believe this is incredible. I'm so excited for you. And let me just say, this is like a mini workout here, okay? 600 pages each, Anthony. What inspired them? Oh, yeah. Uh, these are packed with information. Every line, though, there's no fluff in here. There's no cookie cutter, nutter butter, fluff, whatever in here. This is like packed with information. It's because people have brain problems and we need answers. We can't just get the old like, well, you know, just take a vacation, uh, take a little time off and you're a little burnt out or something. We need real answers. People have the depression, anxiety, OCD, the bipolar, depersonalization. They're suffering and struggling out there. And that's just a few things. And there's so much more everybody's dealing with. All right. Well, before we get into the books, you are a medium. So there is a mystical element to the very yes. material work that you do. Tell me how the two go hand in hand. Well, all the information in the Medical Medium book series comes from above, and I got a kick me sign on my back. So if anybody wants to give me a kick, it's, it's okay. You can start. And But it comes from above this information, and it's new information, original, unique. There's no citations because it's original info, but detailed, comprehensive science before science ever gets it. It's it's incredible and it comes from above. So starting at age four, that happened. So when I was age four, I woke up one morning and heard a voice and that voice had medical information. And I didn't even know what it was saying. I didn't even know what the voice was saying. It was talking about uh, you know, Epstein-Barr viruses and pathogens in people and toxic heavy metals and chemicals and problems and all this stuff. And then illnesses and conditions and it was all advanced though no one ever heard of the information and i had to learn it young and then as i was growing up teach it so i've been a messenger for this information and you know it when i even talk about it even now i still say to myself like who's gonna believe it like it's really that incredible even to this day after all these years and the books are that information put into the books for people to heal so the spirit is like your ghostwriter, Anthony. Yes, definitely. All right, well, let's get into the book. You say your liver is your brain's best friend, but what about the gut? Well, well, okay, well, uh, the popular trend is your gut. It's all about your gut, but really it's about other things like the liver. Everybody's liver gets stagnant and sluggish, filled with toxins and poisons and pathogens. And then 
these stagnant sluggish livers get all fatty and dense and everybody gets bloated with the livers being like this. And then the liver, when it gets sick, even when doctors don't know it, their liver is sick because it's this progression that takes time over the years. When the liver starts to get sick, it can't protect the brain anymore. It can't. Your gut's not protecting your brain. It's your liver that's protecting your brain because that's your filter. Because here's the problem. When the brain starts to become the filter, now we're going wrong. The liver gets clogged up and then all the stuff is floating around in us, all the toxins, you guys. And now the brain is becoming the filter. And when the brain becomes the filter, depersonalization, anxiety, depression, bipolar, OCD, uh, sadness, uh, mystery, anger, everything just starts to go wrong. Weakness in the limbs, fatigue, burning skin on the on the body, uh, pain and numbness, tingles and numbness, everything just starts to go haywire. I think what's interesting about your method is, and you mentioned everybody has a symptom, but rather than taking a symptom and isolating the treatment for that symptom to that particular organ, so acne is a problem in the skin, depression is a problem in the brain, arthritis is a problem in the joints, you seem to find answers in the seemingly unrelated. Would you agree? For sure. Like, let's talk about acne just for a couple of seconds. Well, acne is blamed on hormones, but really what acne is, it's a streptococcus infection, so it's strep. Everybody has strep inside their body. It's just that during hormonal cycles, whether it's puberty or menstruation or some other, or uh, menopause, some type of hormonal, sh hormonal shift or severe stress, like major stress, betrayal, broken trust, something happens in your life, a loss. What happens is when we have any hormonal shifts in the body, the immune system drops. When the immune system drops, anything that sits inside of everybody, like streptococcus, staph, uh, MRSA, um, uh, pathogens of all kinds, they rise, they rise up. Well, when it rises up, it creates a problem. Streptococcus rises up out of our lymph system, and boom, we have acne now. We have acne on our chest. We have acne on our, on our back. We have acne on our face. We have acne all kinds of places. And the liver still plays a role. The immune system drops, the liver's immune system drops, all these bugs and things rise up. But either way, like acne, the cause of acne is streptococcus. And, but people don't know this. It's a medical medium piece of information. But oddly enough, it gets taken later, science uses it, functional doctors use it, they don't cite back, only some of them do, some of them don't, but either way, yes, like that's one example. All right, Anthony, stay right there, we'll be right back with more from Anthony William on the other side. All right, I'm back with the medical medium, Anthony William, discussing his newest books, Brain Saver and Brain Saver Protocols. Now, you've written about toxic heavy metals throughout the medical medium series, and again, in Brain Saver. And, you know, it's something that we never hear about. What turns you onto this issue? And is this something that the average person should be worrying about, heavy metal toxicity? Well, toxic heavy metals information, medical medium information for 35 plus years now getting out there and, and teaching about it, You'll see now, you'll see some doctors talk about metals. They don't have a study to cite from and they don't have any kind of uh, papers or studies, but they'll start talking about metals because they got it from the medical medium books all originally published. Now here's how it works. Metals build up inside our body and they build up inside our brain. And metals don't stay in the bloodstream, you guys. So if you go to the doctor and they do a blood test, sorry about this, they do a blood test and they draw blood out and they look for toxic heavy metals, they'll see very little. Because it's not about exposure in your bloodstream in the moment. It's about metal settling in your organs. Once the metal's in your organ, you're not going to get a brain biopsy to look for metals. A doctor's not going to say, oh, well, ma'am, sir, we're going to go in there and dissect a piece of your brain and study it and look for metals. They're not. It's like hands off. The metals settle inside the organs, and then they start to oxidize. Metals age they actually oxidize. And when they oxidize, they rust. So we have all these little tiny nanoparticles of metal inside our brain and body, and they start to oxidize. And then that oxidation starts to create that depression, starts to create that depersonalization, starts to create OCD, starts to create a feeling of being lost or feeling like you need to be somewhere else and could even head into Alzheimer's because it does. It's metals that create Alzheimer's. 
It's metals that create dementia and it's clusters of metals that creates Tourette's. And so it's super small fragments of metal and they can't find it because it's not in our plain sight and plain view. Well, in your book, you have over 300 symptoms and conditions. I'm curious, is there is there a common thread there or at least a couple common causes that lead to a number of symptoms? Absolutely, and it varies in some other ways. You'll see in the symptoms, conditions in the book and 300 symptoms, conditions, both brain related, neurologically related, and that's the problem. But there's a correlation between pathogens, metals, different toxins and poisons, stress and emotional stress too. I'm never going to undermine emotional stress when we go through things and what it does to the brain physically and body. It's it's really incredible. Well, let's talk about some of the solutions then. What about diet? I mean, I think people are so quick to jump on fad diets and those diets, let's be real, soon become inconvenient or boring or even difficult to sustain. But is there one that you subscribe to, particularly for chronic illness? Well, eat better diets just don't work when it comes down to chronic illness. Eat better diets are fun. I mean, in a way, many ways, they're, uh, they're good because they get rid of processed foods they get rid of fried greasy foods. So eat better diets, there's a whole bunch of them out there to pick from, you can pick from 50 of them. There's doctors with eat better diets, there's podcast doctors with eat better diets. That's not chronic illness. Chronic illness, that's medical medium stuff, that's medical medium information, mystery chronic illness. And what that is, is an eat better diet isn't going to do the trick. You got tingles and numbness, you got aches and pains, burning skin, you got pain in your jaw, pain in your neck, trigeminal neuralgia, back pain that's mysterious. You got all kinds of other issues going on, numbness, tingles everywhere, vertigo, dizziness, ringing in the ears, tinnitus. Eat better diets don't fix all that. So you can go on this eat better diet, that one, try keto, try that, try that, try that. Okay, you might get some results because you're getting off cookies, cakes, and donuts. Cookies, cakes, and donuts. And whatever else, you're getting off of the fried, greasy, processed foods. But guess what? There's a stopping point. When you're chronically sick, you can still be chronically sick off your cookie, cakes, and donuts. And on an eat better diet, medical medium info takes the person to this other level of, wait a minute. You can bring in this, you can bring in that. The tools are here. One size fits all does not work for everybody. And don't get me wrong. I love to eat better stuff out there because it takes people off the cookies, cakes, donuts, and the processed foods. But the difference is once you hit a wall and you've been off that and you're still at each internist and doctor and specialist and neurologist, you may need something else because you're not like everybody else. Well, and you have a number of cleanses in your protocols book. I also noticed that many of the recipes were rich in alkaline foods, leafy greens, berries, all that good stuff, which feels inherently right and true. But is there a method behind it? Well, the world of health's anti-fruit has been anti-fruit. Um, I broke that whole thing out where now fruit is allowed in the keto diets. Now fruit is allowed in all the different diets. It's MM info. And I hate sounding like I'm this big man that did all this big stuff and I got a big head and ego and I'm trying to prove my point. That's not it. It's you weren't allowed to eat fruit in the health movement. It didn't exist. So medical medium information brought that in. That's why you have berries in the keto diet. Now that's why you have uh, more fruit in the, the Mediterranean diet. It's all because of MM. And it's not because I'm smart, like I said, it's from getting the message, being the messenger, and then working hard at trying to save people who are chronically ill. So when it comes down to it, sure, wild foods is what's in the medical medium books, accessible, like the wild blueberry, um, herbs, which are critical, really accessible herbs, leafy greens. Leafy greens were not in the health movement years ago, you guys. It was just iceberg lettuce. It was just lettuce, and that was it. We brought in the leafy greens. I spent 25, 30 plus years getting the leafy greens out there, the kale movement, all of it. So the whole point is, is yes, leafy greens, wild foods, herbs, fruits, and vegetables, that's part of it. You can eat animal protein on medical medium. You can also skip animal protein on medical medium. It's not one size fits all. All right, well, I can't let you go without asking you about celery juice. Is this <laughs> the number one thing people should be doing? And I'll be completely transparent. I subscribe to the celery juice movement. I love it. That's incredible. It's saving lives. It's an incredible tool. It's one of the medical medium tools. Now, I didn't create a celery stick. We know that. But what spirit of compassion, that's the term I use for the voice I hear. Um, that's what it is, spirit of compassion. What happens is that 
16 ounces on an empty stomach of straight celery juice. Don't add anything in it. No lemon water in there. No, no lemon in there. No collagen powder in there. No water in there. No ice. Straight celery juice. Strain it after you juice it to do a fine mesh strainer and you strain it. And do the 16 ounces on an empty stomach and things change. You could be a person who's tried everything and done that, done everything. And when you bring in the celery juice, the needle starts to move. It's a miracle. It's one of the medical medium tools. And the reason why is it's killing off little buggies that are not supposed to be inside of us. Yeast, mold, all kinds of crazy stuff, bacteria, things that aren't good. It's killing things off. And then it's helping to loosen up the poison and toxins and pull it out. And then it rebuilds the stomach acids. People say gut, like you'll hear uh, trendy stuff, the gut, the gut, the gut. Well, what about the gut? What about rebuilding the HCL, the hydrochloric acid? What about our stomach glands? What about our bile and our liver? These are the things that matter in the gut. And celery juice changes that in people. It's incredible. But that's one of the medical medium tools. There's the brain shot therapies in the medical medium brain saver books that are mind blowing that people are screaming about right now. There's so many different cleanses in the medical medium books. So you can pick one out for yourself because you're a different person than the other person. We're not all the same. You can't box us up into one size fits all. And we want instant relief like in the brain saver books. Plus we want to fix things over time. It's, it's here. I can't say it enough. All right, Anthony William is the medical medium whose newest books, Brain Saver and Brain Saver Protocols, are available in stores now. Congratulations on your latest success. I'm honored, you guys. Thank you for giving me a chance to, to send the message out. I can't thank you enough. Welcome back. Let's bring in the panel now. I know your time is valuable, so I really do appreciate you all being here. I'd like to just start with sort of a general reaction to my interview with Anthony William, Dr. Gorfinkel. Well, I listened to it and I was excited for him saying, eat a healthier diet, a Mediterranean diet, a vegetable-based diet, all science-based. Mm -hmm. Where I struggle a little bit is the word from God stuff. You know, I know because I can sense it and I'm a deliverer of a message. I think a lot of great medical things start out feeling with a gut sense, no pun intended with the direction we're going. They start out that way, but it needs science to back it up. We need studies, we need to look at populations. It's a lot more complicated than, sorry to say Marissa, because I know you believe in it, Drink celery juice and your problems are solved. <laughs> well, I have to say there is some method to that because he is helping millions. What do you think? I mean, I agree, Iris, with a lot of what you've said. There was a lot of what he said that wasn't wrong and it resonated with me a little bit. Yeah, so it feels intuitively right. I was surprised that that was some of my reaction, but a lot of what he was saying in terms of you know, explaining that the liver sort of detoxifies. As a gastroenterologist, I hear this a lot, that people say, I wanna, you know, I'm backed up or I'm constipated, there's toxins building up. And that doesn't make sense. That, that might make intuitive sense, but that's not how the body works. There's meant to be bacteria and poop and all kinds of non-sterile, you know, the gut is not a sterile environment, but that doesn't mean toxins are building up in your body if you don't move your bowels that day. So I like that he, I don't know that he was meaning to counter that myth, but I like that he acknowledged that it's actually your liver, and he didn't mention it, but your kidneys that filter out those toxins. What I didn't love is that he then hypothesized that that means that those toxins build up in tissues and your brain and your organs and cause problems. So that part is less scientific, um, but at least his under some of his understanding of the body made sense. All right, well, let's get into the show. We're talking about gut health today. Why is gut health so important, Dr. Joey? You know, I've been practicing in a gut-based practice for about 20 years, and I was always saying to my clients, you are only as healthy as your pipes, which makes sense. If you think about it, you're only as healthy as you're absorbing, digesting, and excreting. The body's an orchestra, Marissa, and so there's a spillover effect, and so that's why we're at the tip of the iceberg with research, with probiotics, with anti-inflammatory foods, with hormonal balance. When your gut is off, of course, the body, the orchestra, tips into other areas, your skin, brain health, your gut is actually called your second brain. And we know, mm. in fact, there is major influence from gut to brain. And so while we can help people with other areas, 
it would be foolish for us as holistic practitioners, as integrative practitioners, as, as medical doctors, not to go back and investigate the integrity of that gut. Well, it is interesting. I mean, you, we hear a lot about the gut microbiome. It's become a bit of a buzzword, and I think it more of a household term in the last five years or so. What is it? Well, the microbiome is a is a ecosystem of bacteria, viruses, uh, yeast, fungi, and they all live in harmony. And you know, when we, you know, through external factors, through diet, medication, stress, it can alter that microbiome. And then this is the issue that we're seeing that many people are having altered microbiomes that end up getting you know chronic illness. So it's just a, the variety of different bacteria that we have. So I'm just going to push back a little bit because we're talking about, imagine the equivalent of, I don't know, about 500 New York cities put together. Yeah. You know, can we all live in harmony and peace at once? And the answer is possibly, it's a, it's a variable population that's constantly changing and it has profound impacts, profound impacts on how we think, profound impacts on what we do and how much we eat. There are fascinating animal studies coming out. The microbiome cares about one thing, itself. It's basically a selfish gene pool directing what it is and how much it is that I'm going to eat. Well, and we're learning more too, uh, Dr. Zenli, about the makeup of a healthy gut microbiome in a you know, in an individual who's healthy versus an individual who's unhealthy. What do we know about how those two microbiomes compare? What I'd say is that the more we learn, the less we understand. So what we've tried to do is say, let's pick a bunch of healthy people, and I'll come back to why that term is confusing already, but let's pick a bunch of healthy people and look at what their microbiotal makeup is, and then look, let's pick a disease and see what the people who have that disease's microbiotal makeup is, and let's compare them and see how they differ. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is, what does healthy mean? So just because I haven't been diagnosed with a condition, does that mean I'm never gonna have it or I'm not programmed to have it? Already there's a flaw because we don't have a crystal ball. The second thing is like you can pick it in terms of one disease, but just because you don't have that one illness or disease doesn't make you otherwise healthy. So it's hard to define what the healthy control group is. So it's all very confusing. But isn't it generally accepted that the more diverse the microbiome, the better? And so then my question would be, Dr. Joey, what is it about a microbiome that is less diverse that causes the disease? Or how does that causality even I work? Does... And, and forming a causal relationship is extremely difficult. And forming a why is extremely difficult. And we're all talking about our food. I really think, guys, I really think we have to look back at our soil mm -hmm. because our soil becomes our food. And we also have to look at the time frame when chronic illness started to elevate, when cancer started to rise. Well, what are we doing to our soil? And so. That is a reflection, how we're treating our animals, how we're treating our environment, and this is a huge topic, that spills over into the microbiome. And so it is a lot more complicated than you're saying than doing a double-blind research. It's very difficult to do a double-blind research study on a bacterial microflora that doesn't have thousands, has billions of microorganisms. Absolutely, and yes. a carrot is not a carrot. So a carrot yeah. that's grown in my backyard is going to be different than a carrot that's grown, say, in industrial farming practices. Well, we are going to get into that just after the break. So stay right there. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Before the break, we were discussing what makes a good and healthy gut. There are, after all, trillions of microbial cells, primarily bacteria in the gut microbiome, which you were mentioning, some causing disease, some beneficial. So to the extent that we can influence this, that could have a big impact on our lives. I ask this question because a person can't own all of their problems. Yeah. Some, some things are innate. Yeah. And so to what extent is diet changing our microbiome? I think it's, it's a big impact, the, the sugar, the processed foods, and you accumulate that with some stress or some other factors. And then what ends up happening is the gut lining starts to break down, has like tiny holes around the gut, and then it starts to leak out toxins. So, I mean, really, it really is what we eat, right, is an important part of trying to maintain a healthy gut. Many people say the secret to longevity is in our genes, though. 
I what mean, plays a bigger <laughs> role, diet or genetics? You know, I think we're it's really comfortable and palatable to use diet as something within our control to be able to change. But I think we're stepping into dangerous grounds and inferring a lot of things. Like, you know, in terms of your comments about the, the gut getting holes and leaking out, as someone whose job is to stick a camera in your gut, a hole is a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there are theories about tight junctions at a molecular level that when disrupted can lead to diseases like Crohn's or colitis, but those are really diagnosable. So I think the problem is we hear these things and then they get interpreted outside of a scientific environment in the lay population in a way that serves as a convenient explanation for things we don't understand. And the danger in that is that we've misinterpreted it. You know, they say that it takes 10 years, at a minimum of 10 years for scientific research to be implemented. For us to get a good double blind research study that changes what we do in holistic or integrative or allopathic medical care, it takes time. And so I think there's two exciting things that are happening. The first exciting thing that research is showing is that our genetics are malleable. Well, hallelujah for that. It means that we have impact on our genetic expression. That's amazing. That means our stress level, our food, what we do in our daily life can affect. It can, it, and this is not to blame anybody who has an autoimmune condition. This means we might be able to improve it. How far can that go? I, ha I take more time in my practice taking people off gluten and dairy than anything else. Now, am I doing that because I just enjoy that? I'm doing that because I'm seeing a positive effect. Well, why is that happening? Mm -hmm. I right. don't have the answer. I know that the gluten in this country is very different than the gluten in Europe. I know that people who can't eat gluten here can eat gluten there. So I'm paying attention to that. Mm -hmm. So it all, there, there's, it's huge. What's tremendously huge. important here is asking the individual to diarize their symptoms. Yeah. That's what I find yeah. tremendously helpful. Most of the time, Within half an hour to 45 minutes, a person will experience that gas or bloating from the time they've ingested whatever food. So it is critical to keep a diary. I agree that a lot of what we do is in fact not based on randomized clinical trials, but I also know that people's bodies speak to them. Mm -hmm. My job as a GP is to try to translate that into a language that they can understand and use in, pr in a practical, daily, living way. All right, let me interject for just one second because I'm in the business of revealing a lot about myself today, but I often joke that my stomach is made of Teflon, okay? So I could probably go to a Mandarin buffet, eat all the fried foods, and I would feel okay, where my husband would be curled over in pain for days. So I wonder, to what extent is my body not speaking to me? Should or am I, am I less healthy than him? I mean, what's going on? So this is, a, this is a conversation I have with patients all the time. Who is the sick person? The person whose body actually sends them a signal to stop eating toxic food. You know, you go to Mandarin, people have piles of deep fried food and seem fine and they walk out. Is that sickness? Or is that health? I don't know. You know, in my view, the irritable bowel individual who does that and walks out doubled over is actually at an advantage because they're mm, not going to yeah. be eating that way. They've learned to listen to their body and they're, they're, they're gonna change what they do and in fact, it's gonna be very much for the better. I would flip that and yeah. say, to what extent is your body listening to you? So if you're going in there calm, you're not worried about what you're gonna eat, you're gonna tolerate this because you have a stomach made of Teflon, what, what role does that play in the lack of development of symptoms? And I bring that up because again, yes, science takes a long time to catch up. But for example, there was a Canadian guideline that came out a few years ago looking at treatment of IBS, of irritable bowel syndrome. Mm -hmm. But when you look at that guideline, what didn't make it for managing IBS mm -hmm. was diet. What did make it was cognitive behavioral therapy. So that doesn't mean diet doesn't work. And I'm not saying that because I agree with you that by there's absolutely a correlation between yeah. some people's symptoms and certain dietary triggers. But what it does say is even when you look at conventional Western data, the data to support cognitive behavioral therapy, meaning focusing on your approach and attitudes to food, symptoms, and lifestyle, had more of an impact in more studies that were more robust with larger patient populations 
than even diet and managing GI symptoms. I'll get your reaction after the break, Dr. Joy, because I know you want to jump in, but stick around, we'll be right back. Welcome back. Have you ever gone with your gut or felt butterflies in your stomach? We use these expressions for a reason. It turns out these experiences clue us into why some research are now calling the gut our second brain. So how does this organ communicate with the brain in our head? Let's put it to the panel. Dr. Joey, many of us have experienced that sort of queasiness in our stomach at times. I felt it a little bit before today's show. Yeah. <laughs> you know, is this anxiety or is this the gut talking to me? Yeah, that's a good question, and research is just tipping into that because we're looking at the serotonin levels in the what we're calling the second brain, the gut, we're now referring to as the second brain, and we're looking at how serotonin is influencing overall brain function and anxiety and other sort of um, mental health issues. And uh, we're at the tip of the iceberg. There's even some probiotics on the market that are addressing gut brain health. Um, but I think it is an exciting, an exciting area. And it's sort of a chicken and the egg because when you are in an anxious state, when you're in a sympathetic mode where your nervous system feels like the bear is chasing you, and unfortunately in today's world, the bear is always chasing us. So whether it's deadlines, whether it's high stress with family, we're just not shutting off enough. And I think it is impacting the gut. And I think that's where things like breath work and meditation and people are, you know, we used to not be able to talk about this all the time, but now people are really open to this sort of parasympathetic where we're lowering nervous system response and we're seeing a very positive gut relationship with that. People's guts are improving. There are also studies emerging talking about the relationship between the gut microbiome and Alzheimer's. I mean, who would have thought Alzheimer's starts in your gut? What's absolutely fascinating about that is that if you take a look at the gut microbiome of someone with Alzheimer's, it's actually a distinct population from someone who does not have Alzheimer's disease. Wow. And what do we find? Higher levels of inflammatory markers in the stool, higher levels of inflammatory markers in the blood of those individuals who have Alzheimer's disease. Wow. So this is a recent study from King's College in which they actually made that direct comparison. True, it's a small study, 70 people in each arm, normal people, normal without Alzheimer's compared to those with full-blown Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And these are the findings. So the connection the, is very established between Alzheimer's, inflammation, and normalcy. They're starting to do things like fecal transplants mm -hmm. to change the composition of your gut microbiome. And so if we're doing that and we understand what the gut microbiome of an individual with Alzheimer's versus an individual without Alzheimer's looks like, I mean, the possibilities are endless. And could, is it conceivable that you could prevent Alzheimer's or at least delay the onset of Alzheimer's with things like fecal transplants. I mean, they're doing a number of studies uh, on this now, and they're seeing there's a reduction in people with uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's where uh, the cognition has improved after having something like that. I mean, there are other stool tests that can be done, um, you know, not so invasive like a fecal uh, transplant, but uh, stool tests that tell us what the current status of our microbiome looks like, the different types of bacteria, the ones that are dangerous to our gut. So there's other things out there as well, not just only the fecal um, mm -hmm. transplants that are available. In, in fairness, yeah. this stuff mm -hmm. is not ready for prime time. Like, I just want yeah. to put it out there. This is stuff yeah. is in the research phase. Sure. However, mm -hmm. interesting trial they did on rats. Mm -hmm. They take the gut microbiome, yeah. i.e. the stool, yeah. and put, put it, it in, in of, of Alzheimer's patients That's and right. put it into those of healthy rats. And the fascinating findings are mm -hmm. the rats seem to develop less memories, That's right. less long-term neuronal connections on sacrifice. They can see that in their brains. So this, yeah. this connection, mm -hmm. it's a fascinating one, but it's not yet ready for prime time. And how do I turn this into actionable material? Mm -hmm. Study after study shows the same thing. It's about the Mediterranean diet. Yeah. It's about reducing the simple carbohydrates. It's about making sure we get enough vegetables and fruits in our diet. Not having, you know what's horrible? Deli meats. Deli meats are extremely bad for us. 
I love deli meats. I grew up on bologna. I love everything that's bad for me. Obviously, Dr. Gorfinkel subscribes to the Mediterranean diet. What about alcohol? Is there any safe consumption? Safe level of consumption? I don't think I can answer that question. So what I mean by that is we don't know. So like everything, so though some people may subscribe to one diet or a certain lifestyle, at the end of the day, there's nothing definitive. If you eat cold cut, like we'll all say, oh, oh my uncle, whoever lived to be 102, smoking cigars and drinking like a scotch a day. We don't, there's certain things that we know are carcinogenic. I would agree in the sense that, you know, probably the number one cause of liver transplantation in the Western world is alcohol. Um, or it's a major related. carcinogen. S so it's mouth, tongue, lip, esophageal, laryngeal. It is a major carcinogen. And let's not, yes. let's not cut that. And it has a bigger effect in women like, than in men. But like all carcinogens, we don't know to what extent or amount this is going to negatively impact the human body in its lifetime. So, and I say that because this, we don't know this. There is no recommendation <laughs> saying that you cannot drink any alcohol because of the, the likelihood of a cancer as opposed to cigarettes where we know that no safe amount, uh, there is no safe amount. So we don't know, and there have been studies showing some benefit to small amounts, and I, you know, I think you can probably get those antioxidants in healthier formats um, than alcohol, but I don't know that we have any definitive data to suggest that you must eat this way and you cannot consume this thing. Well, we know that there's no safe amount of gluten, isn't that right, Dr. Joey? And so I guess my question is, look, how do we go about changing our diets? Because Without knowing what's in my pantry, you know what's in my pantry. I have two young kids, okay? Right. There are cheddar fish, cookies, <laughs> chips, and it's very hard to tell a four-year-old, no, you have to eat leafy greens. So yeah, I mean, we have to do this in, in a way that we can implement it properly into our lifestyle. And the only people who I take off gluten on dairy are those canary in the coal mine people, yeah. like myself. Mm -hmm. If I have gluten or dairy, I am down for four or five days. I am not celiac. I am not celiac. From head to toe, I ache. That's just my bio individuality. If you're like that, we have to do full stop. Most people can have, but it's the whole thing I do with people is lowering your toxic bucket. We all have a yeah. bucket, and our toxicity from soil, from stress, from electronics, from food, it's too high. It's too high in kids, it's too high in adults. And so whatever we can do to bring it down, and some people, that's baby steps. Some people are jumping in the water and do all at once. I like the pragmatism. It, it depends how sick you are. When you're sick, you'll do whatever it takes to get better. Yeah. You know, I can hear my grandmother say, everything in moderation, Marissa, everything yeah. in moderation. Yeah. All right, when we come back, five major things you can do right now to adjust your gut microbiome. That's next. <laughs> After all that, you're wondering how to hit the reset button on your gut. Dr. Joey is here with five major things you can do. But of course, Dr. Joey, the hardest part is getting started. Yes, well, the implementation factor, that's my next book, because I can tell people what to do, but the implementation factor is tricky for them. So let's start small baby steps. Okay. Okay, number one, the American Gut Project has shown plant diversity is very good for gut biome. Mm -hmm. So they say at least 30 different types of fruits and vegetables per week. That's tricky for people. So That's tricky. If we can just start looking around our grocery store and eating a few different foods, especially in kids that they're not used to, mm -hmm. that's why smoothies are king. Mm -hmm. You can sneak anything into a smoothie. Do what you can as far as plant diversity. Got it, all right. Okay, fiber. Good fiber is really important. It's the broom that sweeps things out. We want people to have daily bowel movements, and that's a whole other show, but we want make, to make sure we have enough fiber. So ground flax seeds or chia seeds, whole grains, Quality whole grains, they can be gluten-free or they can be regular whole but grains. But not whole grains and bread. Who says bread's bad? Doesn't bread contain a whole bunch of sugar and gluten? The right type of bread. So we have to know what the type of bread, and we can do whole grains. So we don't have to say absolute. So, um, and, and, and we need, the body runs on glucose. The body doesn't run on ketones. So we Got need it. some grains, some fruits, some vegetables to keep that glucose up in our body. What about sourdough bread? I've heard sourdough doesn't raise your insulin levels. Is that true? Yes, and sourdough is higher in enzymatic activity, so it's easier to digest. So people who are hardcore gluten-free still can't have it, but people who can have gluten, yeah, sourdough's great. All Delicious, right. too. Interesting. All right, what's the third? I see you got sauerkraut here. Yeah, so we want some fermented foods. They do help with that microbiome, with that bacterial um, 
uh, gut lining. So um, fermented foods, sauerkraut, miso, kimchi, you know, you can put it on a sandwich. You can have some yogurt. So if you're okay with dairy too, yogurt is a great option. Dairy is interesting because people will say dairy causes inflammation. As far as dairy goes, if you're okay with it, by all means, you okay. can get your calcium from it. If you're not okay with it, if there's an autoimmune condition, if you have elevated inflammatory reaction, it is a good idea, cut it out. You know, we were talking about sourdough. And what's fascinating, it's one of these superfoods in that it is one of the highest probiotic foods. And I would agree with you that the vast majority of breads you find wrapped in plastic sold on the regular shelf are bad for people. They're high in sugar, they're high in gluten, and when we talk about breads that are so-called good, I personally have found that the term whole grains is completely abused in our market. <laughs> you know, I can go to, the, I'm not kidding, I go to the cereal aisle, and that peanut butter bowl cereal, guess what? That's labeled a whole grain. <laughs> what the true. F? Oh. Seriously? Yeah. Like, that's a whole grain, and yet that's where people are taking their education So you want to look for the word sprouted. So if you sprout a grain, yeah. you've increased the enzymatic activity as well. So okay. sprouted grain, whole grain bread, it's like this whole new lexicon you have to, to but it's learn. Confusing, it's right? confusing, It's confusing. And hard. people, I don't, the pile of what to do yeah. to be healthy is getting higher. People are confused, yeah. and I don't blame them. Yeah, absolutely. What the F, by the way, does not stand for what everybody here seems to think it is. It's not the food, <laughs> but that's what it stands for. I need to think. Okay, what's step four? Step four is superfoods. So there are certain superfoods. It's not just sort of a, a catch phrase thing to say. Lemons are superfoods. They help with digestion. Cilantro is a fantastic for detoxifying. Leafy greens are terrific. So the more that you can get things like sweet potatoes in the diet, these foods contain phytochemicals. Phytochemicals are nutrients that help fight off disease. Food isn't like medicine. Food is a form of medicine. So we love food, we eat food. But when you are sick, when you need to improve health, we can use food as medicine. And step number five, what is it? Step number five is hydration. So, so many people are walking around and they're drinking too much coffee and they're having not enough water and if, I I'm fundamentally believe if you're not properly hydrated, I can't get you there. Mm -hmm. And so um, proper hydration is two liters of water per day. And a lot of people are just, for whatever reason, I have a lot of teachers as clients, they don't want to run to the bathroom in the middle of the day. They're just not hydrating properly. All right, Dr. Joey, Dr. Zenley, Dr. Gorfinkel, and Drina, thank you all for taking the time. And that is it for us today. Hope you've learned something. We'll see you next time. For now, it's time to zoom out.